God for our moms today. It's Mother's Day, and uh, we're going to ask the question today, how important is mom? Well, listen, everybody ought to be able to appreciate the importance of of mother, even if it's not Mother's Day, we know how important our moms are. You know, like I heard about that 15-year-old boy, and he came home, and every day when he came home, his mom always had something to eat for him, and and uh, he came home like every day, like every 15-year-old boy comes home starving to death. And uh, when he came in, he didn't smell any fresh cookies, he didn't, he didn't see any food laid out, and he didn't even see his mom. So he started doing the only thing that he could do. He started saying, Mom, Mom, Mom. And by the time he heard his mom say, Yeah, honey. And he crept over to her room and looked in, and she was laying on the, across the bed and looked too good. And he said, Mom, are, are you sick? And she said, well, honey, I'm really not feeling too good. And he said, well, don't worry, Mom. Do not worry about it because I'm getting pretty big, and I can carry you to the stove, so don't worry about a thing. <laughs> so everybody knows how important moms are. The reality is Mother's Day comes only once a year, and then even then moms don't get a day off. Am I right? But we know how important moms are, and we don't want to be like that boy. But when you think about how important moms are, Forbes magazine has actually quantified the importance of moms by looking at mom's Mother's Day by the numbers. For instance, according to Forbes magazine, today we're going to spend about $168.94 per person on mom. That's a total of $20.7 billion spent today for Mother's Day. Now, if you moms at the end of the day kind of do some calculation, you can see if you broke even by the end of the day. This is the third largest card sending holiday. 141 million cards will be exchanged, and it is the second largest gift sending day behind Christmas. I heard about one woman who literally spent her whole life obsessed with Mother's Day. She spent the first part of her life fighting and advocating and campaigning on behalf of Mother's Day. She spent the second half of her life opposed to Mother's Day. I'm not making this up. Perhaps you've read the history of Mother's Day, which if you have a real exciting life, I'm sure you have, but Anna Marie Jarvis is the mother of Mother's Day. It was her obsession to make Mother's Day a national holiday, and she spent uh, tireless hours advocating and campaigning and, uh, and relentlessly trying to get the U.S. government to make Mother's Day a national holiday, and she finally was able to persuade President Woodrow Wilson and Congress to make the second Sunday of May Mother's Day. And, of course, she was extremely happy when they finally did that, and Mother's Day became a national holiday uh, back about uh, uh, 90 years ago, about 80 or 90 years ago. But, you know, she was so obsessed about Mother's Day that she actually trademarked the phrase Mother's Day. She owned the trademark on the phrase Mother's Day. She even trademarked the phrase Second Sunday of May. She owned all of that. Mother's Day was her life. But then she was one of those people who liked to control things just a little bit too much. And she didn't like the way that the nation was celebrating Mother's Day, so she began to advocate against the celebration of Mother's Day. For instance, let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. She thought it was atrocious that people would actually purchase pre-made Mother's Day cards. Can you imagine? I mean, can you imagine not giving your mother a Mother's Day card now or your wife a Mother's Day card? I mean, it's just out of the uh, realm of possibility. But this woman thought that it was a sign of laziness if you didn't hand make your card. Can you imagine what she would think today when we're texting mom? Happy Mother's Day, mom. <laughs> <clears throat> She was so incensed about the way the nation was celebrating Mother's Day that this woman literally spent her entire family inheritance against Mother's Day, fighting against it, campaigning against what it had become, and she literally died in poverty because she spent her entire inheritance advocating and fighting against what Mother's Day had become in the nation. I mean, I think you could admit that this woman was obsessed with Mother's Day. And the truth of the matter is, mother is important, but it's not the card or the flowers or the meal you're going to buy for mom, the meal you are going to buy for mom today. 
Now, if you're a mom, the card and the flowers and the meal is a pretty big deal. But ladies and gentlemen, how many of you would recognize today on Mother's Day, it isn't the card or the flower or the gift that is the most important. On Mother's Day, it is mother that is most important. And everybody here can agree that moms are very important. In fact, if you're here today, it's because mom was important. And uh, if moms are important, we all know they are, how much more important is a godly mom? What is the impact of a woman who prays and raises her children to be faithful in the things of the Lord? Now, I know what some of you are thinking. You're probably thinking to yourself, well, you know what? About half of us are thinking, well, pastor, I'm not a mom. I'm a guy. So if it's all the same to you, I'm going to clock out right about now. Somebody let me know when it's over. Let me give you two reasons why that's not a good idea. Number one, your wife is sitting right there. And if you roll out during this message, Jack, you're toast the rest of the day. If there was ever a day when you paid attention like this, the world depended upon what I have to say. For her sake and the fact that she's watching you, if you don't want to make her, I mean, embarrassed by the fact that your eyes are already rolling back in your head, man, whatever it takes, pinch yourself, step on your own toe, stay awake for the next 25 minutes because, brother, the rest of your day's happiness depends on it, okay? <laughs> now, that's just a word to the bros. <laughs> but I got a second reason. The second reason why this message actually applies to all of us is because, ladies and gentlemen, we are in the house of God, and we are going to declare a message from the Lord. And in this culture in which we live today, can we say too much about the importance of godly families today? I mean, can, can the church of Jesus Christ overemphasize the importance of a godly family. We live in a culture where 11 states have redefined what marriage is. It has only been since 2001 that anybody anywhere in the history of civilization defined marriage as something other than between a man and a woman. Ladies and gentlemen, we're living in a culture where most of the children born in the United States are born to unwed mothers. We are living in a culture that is redefining what families are rapidly, faster than any of us can keep up with it. I think that it's important that we say all we can about what God says about the role of family members. So whether it's mom or dad or sister or brother, God has a word about families that he needs to speak to our hearts today. And brothers and sisters, this applies to all of us. So this morning, as we look at the most important responsibility that anybody will ever have, and that is the responsibility of being a godly family member. I want us to look together at the subject, the blessings of a godly mom. Would you open your Bibles with me, please, to the story of a really godly mom who influenced not only her time, not only her family, not only the world she lived in, but she literally influenced history, because we're going to look today at a woman named Jochebed, the mother of Moses. Would you open your Bibles, please, to Exodus chapter 2. Exodus chapter 2, we're going to begin reading in verse 1. Exodus chapter 2, verse 1. You'll find this on page 55 in the Bible provided the pew rack. Here's what the Word of God says. Now, a man of the tribe of Levi married a Levite woman, and she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. Now, that sounds like it all happened in a nine-month period. Let me tell you something. That's 12 years compressed at least. You say, how do you know? because he had a 12-year-old sister named Miriam. And the Bible frequently compresses time. As a matter of fact, the first 40 years of Moses' life, which took two hours to tell in the movie, <laughs> is only 15 verses of Exodus chapter 2. So what we're seeing here is highly compressed time. So the Bible says, Now a man of the tribe of Levi married a Levite woman, which is the priest class of the Jewish people, and she became pregnant, gave birth to a son, and when she saw that he was a fine child, the Hebrew there could mean he's cute as a bug's ear, or it could mean, it probably means something a little bit more uh, about spiritual life. This word probably indicates that they realized that this was a child highly favored of God. 
And the Bible says he was a fine child, and because of that, she hid him for three months. You say, hid him? What in the world? Pastor, I don't really remember this story that well. I mean, uh, what is going on here? And the Bible says when she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him and coated it with tar and pitch and then placed the child in it and put it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile. You say, hold it. Is this a child abandonment story or a Mother's Day sermon? Well, it looks one way, but it's going to turn out another as most of life does. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. Then Pharaoh's daughter went down to the Nile to bathe, and her attendants were walking along the riverbank. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her female slave to get it. She opened it, that is, she poured, you know, opened up uh, probably some cloths that were covering the baby to keep that hot Egyptian sun off of him. She opened it and saw the baby. He was crying, and she, that is, Pharaoh's daughter, felt sorry for him. In other words, what happened? The maternal instinct of Pharaoh's daughter kicked in. And she saw this crying baby, and she, her heart went out. And she said, this is one of the Hebrew babies, she said. And then his sister, that is Miriam, who we come to know later as an adult, then his sister asked Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go and get one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? You're starting to see how this is all according to plan. It's told as if it's all a bunch of accidents and, and coincidence, but I think what we see here is a master plan unfolding. Would you like me to go get one of the Hebrew women to nurse him? And yes, she said, that's a great idea. So the girl went and got the baby's mother, and Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this baby and nurse him, and I'll pay you for it. Man, this is getting better every minute. And so the woman took the baby. Now, this is his own mother. Took the baby and nursed him. That probably took a minimum of three years, maybe more. And when the child grew older, she took him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son, and she named him Moses. Now, the word Moses sounds a lot like the Hebrew for to draw out because he was taken out of the water. But in reality, Moses is, he, is Egyptian. Remember the famous Pharaoh named Ramses? In those ancient dialects, ancient languages, there were no vowels, just consonants. Ramoses sounds a lot like Moses. It's not unlikely, it's not out of the realm of possibility that Moses was also referred to as Ramoses, like Ramses. This is an Egyptian name. So here we see a tremendous story, and the lead characters in this story is really not Moses because he's just a silent little baby. Really, the lead characters in this story is a godly mom, a godly sister, and a stepmother who had a, a mother's heart that was used in a tremendous way to help impact the history of civilization. You know, it was Charles Stanley, the pastor of the First Baptist Church of Atlanta, and a well-known Christian author and television and radio uh, preacher and teacher who said, and I quote, a godly mother is an awesome treasure. Would you agree with that? A godly mother is an awesome treasure. Ladies and gentlemen, all mothers are a treasure, but a godly mother is a double treasure. And you know, I never thought about it before, but as I was reading over this passage this week and praying about it, it occurred to me that there are only a few characters in this drama of Moses' life. In fact, as I mentioned a moment ago, the first 40 years of Moses' life occur in 15 verses of this story. And who are the lead characters in this story? Well, you've got his mother, his birth mother, who we learn later in the Bible is named Jochebed. And then you've got his sister, who we learn later is named Miriam. And then you've got the Pharaoh's daughter. And then you've got some female servants. Ladies and gentlemen, in the early days of Moses' life, there is no father figure mentioned. All of the influencers in Moses' life, the Bible is going out of its way to demonstrate, were women. And pivotal in that drama was a godly mother. 
who loved the Lord with all of her heart, and every decision she made was a decision based on her faith in the Lord and in his plan for her and for her family. Now, I'm not saying that Moses didn't have a father. The Bible says he does. But the Bible makes it very clear here that the history of the world was changed because a godly mother protected her baby named Moses. Now, if you were going to com uh, compile a list of the 100 greatest people who ever lived, would Moses be on your list, yes or no? He gave us the Ten Commandments, the first five books of the Bible. Would you agree that Moses would have to be on anybody's list of the 100 greatest people who've ever lived? And brothers and sisters, Moses was able to do what he did because of a godly mother. So ladies and gentlemen, if you ever have a skeptic or a cynic or a contemporary say that the Bible is a bunch of patriarchal stories uh, written to keep women in their place, it is obvious that that person has never read the Bible. Because some of the greatest heroes in the Bible are bold, strong, godly women. And some of the greatest, uh, most flamboyant figures in the Bible are some of the most terrible people in the world were also ungodly women. And that's because the Bible gives us a complete picture of life as it really is. There are some godly people and there are some ungodly people in the world. There are some godly women in the world that make a big dent on their uh, world, and there are some ungodly women that make a, a, a negative dent on their world. But in this passage of Scripture, we see the importance of a godly mom and how she is able to influence through her child the history of the world. And ladies and gentlemen, let me just say this to you. While not every mom influences the history of the world, every mom who raises her children in a godly home, who leads her child to Christ and makes sure that her children have the opportunities to be discipled in a faithful environment where the Bible is taught, every mom like that may not affect history, but every mom like that impacts eternity for the souls of her own children. And that's why I say that there is no role that you will ever play that is more important. There's no job you can have. There's no activity you can be engaged in. There's no book you can write. There's no song you can sing. There is no position you can be appointed to that'll ever impact history and eternity greater than being faithful as a family member, serving the Lord and helping other family members come to know him. So how is it that a godly mom blesses her children? Well, I want us to notice some principles today. Notice this principle, the decisions. The decisions of a godly mom bless her children. The decisions of a godly mom. What am I talking about? Look at verse 1. Now a man of the tribe of Levi married a Levite woman. And she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. And when she saw that he was a, a fine child, a favored child, she hid him for three months, but when she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him and coated it with tar and pitch and then placed the child in it and put it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. Billy Sunday, the early 20th century American evangelist, once said, and I quote, there is more power in a mother's hand than in a king's scepter. There is more power in a mother's hand than in a king's scepter. And in this passage of Scripture, that is absolutely correct. Let me tell you why. Because this story is the story of a mother who is trying to protect her children. You say, well, I don't understand that because she took this little boy when he's three months old, put him in a paper basket, put pitch and tar and asphalt all over it. That's the last place you'd think you'd want to put a baby. And then she covered him up and put him in the river and let him float away. What kind of mom is that? Well, ladies and gentlemen, remember the story. The Jews had gone down to Egypt as highly favored citizens, but over 400 years they had become the slaves of the Egyptians. And uh, then one day a pharaoh looked around and said, these Israeli families have a lot of kids and they're growing exponentially. And the reality is one of these days, these Hebrew sons will grow up and they'll resent us for the slavery that we've placed them under. And they will become an army instead of a group of slaves. And he passed an edict. It's told in uh, uh, Exodus chapter 1, verse 22, where the Bible says, Then Pharaoh gave this order to all his people. Every Hebrew boy that is born, you must throw into the Nile, but let every girl live. 
So about the time Moses was born, this edict had been passed. And let me ask you something. Do you think any pro-life mom is going to agree to the government's edict when it says kill your baby? It's not going to happen. And brothers and sisters, there's a principle here. I can't get too deep into it, but let me just state it. Let me be absolutely clear about it. When your government stands opposed to the clear word of God and insists that you disobey what God says, you must disobey your government. Now, if you tweet that, would you please refer them to watch the whole message, okay? <laughs> Give it a couple days so we got it online so they can see the whole context of what I just said. Because you know how the IRS rolls these days, and we need to be a little careful, you know. I do still pay taxes, and, you know, I don't want them circling around me, amen? You say, Pastor, you're getting political. Man, the world we live in is getting political the last time I checked. And so this, this government said, you got to kill your babies. And this pro-life mom said, not going to happen. So she hid her baby for three months. But guess what? You can hide a newborn, but when a baby gets up about three months, they're very loud. Amen? Some of you moms know what I'm talking about. You say, boy, I can't wait till my baby gets a little older so I can sleep. Let me know when that happens. <laughs> you can't sleep when they're babies, and then you get out of the habit. And then when they get a driver's license, you can't sleep because they're out with the car. And then when they leave your home, you can't sleep because they're not at your house anymore. You might as well just forget sleep. It's out of the picture for you from now on. Don't sleep here either because that's not good. <laughs> Don't catch up on my time. Amen? But let me tell you something, folks. She had some decisions she had to make, so she did the only thing she could do. And when you read this story and you see how it all worked out, this is not just a random decision. What it looks like, the Bible is not specific in this, but it appears to me as I read it that this is an orchestrated series of events that for the last three months they had been going down to the Nile and they had been watching that Pharaoh's daughter the princess of Egypt came down at a specific time every day to a specific location to bathe in the Nile River where the current was slow and the water was shallow and one day when they could hide this little Hebrew boy no longer they made a little papyrus basket and they pitched with tar all around it to make it completely water uh, uh, resistant. And they put the little baby in a cloth and covered the cloth to keep that hot Egyptian sun from scorching him. And they placed him among the thick reeds that grow so the water could not carry him away. And while he was lodged in there, Jochebed went back home but left Miriam to watch, verse 4, say, to watch to see what would happen. And guess what happened? What happened was exactly what they thought would happen. Along came the princess of Egypt to bathe in that spot where she came every day at that time. And they heard that baby crying. And when the princess of Egypt saw that beautiful little boy, the maternal instinct kicked in and she said, I am going to adopt this child as my own. Brothers and sisters, can you imagine what it must have been like for Jochebed, this godly mom, to take her little boy, place him in a basket, and release him into the current of the Nile River, one of the longest rivers in the world. Can you imagine what it must have felt like for her to know that there were predators everywhere, and she had to take a three-month-old baby, place him in a basket. She had no other choice. It was one of those tough decisions that families have to make. And may I just say, brothers and sisters, that this was a godly decision, and a godly family doing the best that they could. How many of you have lived long enough walking with God, serving God, loving God? How many of you have lived long enough to know that no matter how close you walk with God, you are not exempt from the tough decisions in family life? But brothers and sisters, I don't know what your tough decision will look like. I hope that it's never that you've got to put a baby in a paper basket alongside the banks of a river. 
But brothers and sisters, I do know that many of us are facing decisions that are similar in that you're having to take that child who is now 17 or 18 years old and you're having to place that child in the current of this culture and you're having to step away because it's time to let the current take that child as he or she matures. And you're now realizing that as a parent, you can't go everywhere they go. You can't be with them all the time. And you're going to have to release that child into the current of circumstances circumstances that are beyond your ability to control but when you release your child into the fast moving current of our culture don't forget there is an unseen hand there is an invisible hand of providence that will guide that child the bible says train up a child proverbs 22 6 train up a child in the way he will go should go and when he is old he will not depart from it and ladies and gentlemen, when Jochebed put that baby in that Nile, she was doing it as an expression of her faith that God would take care of that baby. And you say, well, Pastor, you're reading an awful lot into that. Well, I have some help. Because the New Testament says that very thing. As a matter of fact, would you listen to what Hebrews chapter 11, verse 23 says? You have it right here. You can read it with me. The Bible says, by faith. By faith, Moses' parents hid him for three months. Listen, what they did in the life of this little child was not just the normal paternal or maternal instinct. It was beyond that. Everything they did in this story was an act of their faith in God. What were they believing for? What were they trusting for? Listen, the law said they had to kill that baby, but they were trusting in God and believing in God that God had a bigger plan for that little life. How many of you are seeing your children go through some things that you can't understand. But a long time ago, you started praying and agonizing and believing, oh, listen, that God has a much bigger plan than circumstance has for my baby. God has a bigger plan than this world has for my baby. God has a bigger plan for my baby than I've got for my baby. God's even got a bigger plan for your child than your child has for himself. Child of God, listen to me. The Bible says, by faith, Moses' parents hid him. For three months after he was born, because they saw he was no ordinary child. In other words, they believed God had a plan for his life, and they were not afraid of the king's edict. Ladies and gentlemen, there comes a time in the life of every family when you've got to make the tough decisions, but you are making tough decisions along with making trusting decisions because every tough decision in a Christian family's life will call for you to trust in the invisible hand of God that guides the lives of not only only moms and dads, but guides the lives of our precious children as well. You don't see God in these first few verses, but can anybody deny his presence? I mean, this is Moses, the liberator of Israel, the one who gave us the Ten Commandments, the one who wrote the first five books of the Old Testament, one of the greatest men who has ever lived whether Christian, Jewish, or secular, no list could be written without including this great leader. And can you deny that God was involved in these details even though God was not completely uh, obvious and conspicuous in any of it? Because you have moms and dads that were living by faith. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't know what you are going through as a family. Some of you may be going through the toughest portion of life, the toughest phase of life, the toughest season of life that you've ever been through as a family, and you may wonder, where is God? I don't see him. I don't sense him. Listen, God will never leave your side. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. Even if you do not see his invisible hand, if you can't trace his hand, trust his heart. God's working in your family. You've got to cling to that promise. How many of you ever heard of E.V. Hill? Dr. E.V. Hill was one of the greatest preachers of the 20th century. For a long time, pastored the Mount Zion Missionary Baptist Church of Los Angeles, California. He became the youngest president of the National Baptist Convention, the largest body of black Baptists in the United States. Dr. E.V. Hill was an author. He was on television preaching constantly. He was a friend of uh, uh, political leaders. He prayed at the inauguration of 
President Nixon. He was a close associate with the ministry uh, of Dr. Billy Graham. He fed thousands of people and cared for thousands of people in Los Angeles through his church, the Mount Zion Missionary Baptist Church. And you would think a man like that must have started out with a lot of privileges, but he started out with nothing but challenges. E.V. Hill was born during the early days of the Great Depression in Texas. A black baby in a poor black family. And when he was four years old, E.V. Hill's mother had to make the toughest decision of her life. Because of her poverty, she could not feed her children. He was the fifth, fourth or fifth of a large family. She couldn't take care of him anymore. And so when he was four years old, E.V. Hill's mother did what she never wanted to do. She gave her little boy to a family friend on another part of the state to take care of. When E.V. Hill was four years old, he said goodbye to his mother and his brothers and sisters to go live with a person he barely knew. But he came to know her only as Mama. And Mama was a godly Christian woman. And she saw something very special in little Ed Hill. And she started encouraging him. She started telling him that there was no mountain too high. She started reminding him that there was nothing too difficult. She started challenging him to get a good education so that he devoted himself to his schoolwork. He, he, he uh, graduated as the only kid who graduated from his school. But Mama kept telling him, that's not enough. She said, Ed, you got to go to college. And they were poor. And in the fall of the year after he graduated from high school, Mama took Ed down to the bus station. And in an old beat-up suitcase tied together with some, with some rope, there were two pair of blue jeans and an old suit she'd got from another family member. She handed Ed that suitcase, a bus ticket, and five bucks. And she said, you go to Prairie View College, Prairie View A&M. And by the time he got there, he had $1.90 left. He was standing in line for registration. And he saw the other kids, mostly white. And he saw the other kids, and it required $80 in cash to register for classes. And he said the enemy started speaking into his life, saying, what are you doing here? You are not going to be welcome here. You're broke. You're black. This is not where you need to be. Now you don't even have enough money to get home. What are you going to do now? But he stayed in line. And it, the kid in front of him was the next to register. And E.V. Hill had no idea what he was going to do. And he looked out of the corner of his eye and he saw a distinguished man in a suit coming toward him. And the man walked up to him and said, are you Ed Hill? And E.V. Hill said, yes, sir, I am. He said, well, Ed, did you get our letter? It was the president of the college. He said, Ed, did you get our letter? He said, no, sir, I didn't get any letter. Well, he said, Ed, we've been trying to contact you because we're going to give you a full scholarship for four years, tuition, room and board, and $35 a month spending money. And E.V. Hill, to the day he died, when he told that story, he said, I didn't think about what the next four years would hold. I didn't think about how I was going to have the money I needed. I didn't think about the classes I was going to take. All I could think about was Mama saying, Mama will be praying for you. 